welcome to the second episode of Instant Strategy Talks. Instant Strategy Talks is getting the most out of your ServiceNow platform. My name is Ruben Koster and I'm a digital transformation expert at Platformation. In episode one, we've spoken about whether or not your organization can make the transition towards a new ServiceNow instance. We've discussed the following uh, benefits for going out of the box. Massive savings on maintenance costs, a reduction in upgrades, efforts, the utilization of ServiceNow to its full potential, and the opportunity for continuous improvement. Lastly, ServiceNow is also changing his development and deployment ways of working. And this is also a great opportunity for you to make that switch. If you have not watched or listened to this podcast yet, please check it out. In episode two, we will focus more on how to transition to this new instance. In this episode, we will explain our proven project deployment, almost guaranteeing success. To explain our approach, we will break down the transition into three different basic elements. That is people, process, and technology. Now, you may ask yourself, why break down a transition into these three elements? Well, this breakdown provides us with a complete view of the transitional scope. People, process, and technology framework has been around for a long time, since the 1960s. And it's designed to improve operational efficiency for employees and for tools. If you forget one of these elements, uh, your change will not be a success. And you will not get all of the benefits out of your ServiceNow platform. To easily explain our approach, we will turn the order around. Then we will first focus on technology and the process element to set the scene of the approach. Then we will move more towards the people part. The very first step in our approach is to take the existing environment and connect it up with the new ServiceNow environment. We want to make sure that the data is in sync and that the out-of-the-box processes are agreed upon with the different process owner. Ideally, completely sticking to out-of-the-box. Then the next step is to onboard the first fulfiller user group. The fulfillers are people that are working in the backend of ServiceNow and therefore resolving tickets that end users have created. This step is, can only be done once the work that is available in the old system is also available in the new system. That means the tickets that were open in the old system are in the new system, but also the processes and the work that they are used to doing, that it also is available in the new environment. This in order to make sure that the adoption of the new process and the new uh, technology is actually possible. The third part is the repeat of that same um, migration. So that means that we are onboarding larger and larger groups over towards the new environment. We grow these migration teams in size in each different waves that passes. Also, we move over the integrations that are perhaps between the old service now and partners or suppliers. Then lastly, we migrate end users over towards the new portal. These are the customer of the client or the internal customers that you may have. They are used to uh, using the service portal that is available to them in the old portal and it is now available in the new system. So the new portal will now be available. Other acronyms that are used for end users are uh, portal users or internal users. And we want to make sure that these end users did not notice uh, the transition that was there before. They need to focus on their core business. ServiceNow, in essence, is a supporting function. So it supports the activities of the day-to-day -day operations of these customers. So in order to keep this transitional impact as minimal as possible, we wait until the very end to actually make this portal available to them. The very last thing that we do is we decommission the old ServiceNow environment. And due to compliancy or HR regulations, often the old ServiceNow environment uh, that you've been using before needs to stay open for a period of time. Access, however, can be heavily restricted in order to ensure the adoption of the new instance. So next we will look at the people side of the migration. Our approach depends on sticking out of the box. And this means that the processes and the data is relatively set. That means that most of the effort actually needs to be placed in making sure that the users or the people are going to be using the new system. 
And as a result, uh, the fulfiller onboarding of the new uh, environment requires communication, training, and stakeholder management. And this all falls under the people management side of uh, the transition. I will name now a couple of vital principles that we've seen in the past that need to absolutely be there in order to make the transition a success. First one is communicate on time. I've seen this happen at the client before. Always start to share snippets of information whenever it is available. And don't wait until a moment in time where all of the information is out there on, uh, on, on the plate. What I've seen before happen is that this was not done. So they waited a long time, uh, internal stakeholders at the organization started to create a lot of noise and then a lot of effort needed to be placed to manage back the uh, expectations, uh, but also the information that was mismatched. Second, we evaluate the communication channels that we have. So we try to reuse as many channels that were used before. Creating new channels takes a lot of effort. You need to create a little bit of a buzz around these channels uh, and reusing existing channels people are already familiar with saves a lot of time and effort. Also, you cannot assume that people will just be consuming knowledge from one single type of channel. So use multiple. Try to use SharePoint, try to use Yammer and a combination of those. Try to use Workplace and perhaps some other type of internet that you're using within your organization. Third one is never surprise. Surprise is in human nature that we want to wow people. Uh, in OCM, this is absolutely something that you never do. In order to make sure that you manage people well, you need to give them information at the right time, as we stated before. The best case scenario for actually surprising or trying to wow people is uh, that you get a happy reaction and people are actually wowed. I've also experienced the other side of, uh, of this where a client, a lead portal designer, wanted to wait until the very end before communicating the design of the portal uh, to the leadership team. This completely backfired. The leadership team was not involved and they were not very happy with this. And as a result, a lot of effort needed to be put in place to redesign the portal in such a way that it was also compliant to the ways that leadership saw it. The fourth point is create a buy-in of senior management. Now, I already spoke about that a little bit before, but now in a positive note. So I've seen at the large oil and gas company that uh, customization was something that was always talked about. A large approval structure was put in place, which made it extremely difficult for people to push through customization. Therefore, everybody was aligned towards one single common goal, and that was to stick to out of the box. And ultimately, what? this whole transition is all about, is to stick to that out of the box. The very last step that we take in our approach is to onboard the end user towards the new portal. And all of the different steps that we've taken up to now is brought to us until this final moment where we bring live the new service portal. Two major points need to be available as part of the service portal. The first one is that it needs to be completely intuitive. So people need to automatically understand how the system works and how the portal works. Also, it needs to look attractive. People need to be engaged with it. It needs to be happy to actually utilize the portal. And therefore also the branding guidelines of the clients absolutely need to be used. What we generally try to aim for is the Pareto principle. So the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the end users should be able to utilize the portal without any instructions. The other 20% should be minimally guided in such a way and instructed in such a way to use the portal. The minimal guidance needed, what we used in the past, again, also an example of an oil and gas company, is that we would utilize a guided tour with the sole purpose of understanding the portal's functionality and creating a step-by-step -step instruction on the portal itself. In addition to that, we also created an internet article the goal of this is to create clarity for the end user. It was there to inform the customer on when actually your, uh, the portal will become live, but also what is happening to the existing tickets that perhaps they had in the old portal. The goal ultimately was indeed to create clarity, but also for the project team to minimize the amount of calls and the amount of tickets that were created 
uh, in, with regards to questions that end users may have. Now that you know that it's time for you uh, to either consider replacing your ServiceNow system with a new one, and that you understand the approach on how to transition towards a new instance, I would like to just quickly summarize the benefits of our approach. Again, looking at the principle and at the framework of people, process, and technology. Starting off with people. We started with a small group, and therefore we have an opportunity to learn and fine tune the onboarding approach. The learnings from the previous wave that we used before, we can actually utilize in the next wave. From a process point of view, we are making uh, the processes operational. And that means that we are no longer talking about theory, but we are actually having fulfillers and agents working in the backend with the new processes. We can get feedback from them and also improve the process as such. From a technology point of view, you have the opportunity to con continuously deploy functionality on the production environment. And that means that you can test configuration and test new functionality with the operational teams. And this is, of course, always the true test of uh, functionality building. If you have any other questions about our approach, please don't hesitate to stop and uh, drop us a message in the comments or via email. Thank you very much for listening.